Thank, thank you. Thank you, Adam and Pip. Hey, great to be with you today. It's a bit strange, isn't it? These times, this uh, season, we were just uh, it had a, a prayer point come through um, uh, just this morning for uh, Terry and Mari Bennett, who you would know, uh, maybe uh, part of our church here. Uh, Terry's mum just passed away, elderly lady, but she lives in New South Wales, and the challenge of getting there, engaging with family, um, just a difficult season. But there's good news as well. Rob Moxie is just walking out the auditorium. Um, just heading up there, give us a well, thanks, Rob and Lena, his wife. They had a baby this week on Monday, their second son. Very exciting. All is well. Uh, Lena and Rob and Theo and the new baby are here today. Come and say hello. Not too loud though. Only six days in, so just be gracious. And it's very exciting. Very exciting news. Uh, we're starting a new series today uh, about cultural discernment. Uh, understanding what it is that's happening around us. If you don't know me, Steve Peach is my name. I'm the ministry team leader here. A uh, special welcome if you're visiting or your first time. Um, this will be three weeks, this series, and comes off the back of where we launched ourselves at the start of the year, thinking about the concept of resilient faith, recognising that we're moving into a season uh, where we're going to need some resilient faith. We identify it back then as, as Tonka Tough. Uh, your, your faith's going to need to be able to take a few hits, right? Uh, and so this picture of resilient faith comes out of some material from the Barna Research Group in the US. A guy by the name of John Kinnaman wrote a book. He works for Barna, uh, David Kinnaman, uh, wrote this book um, uh, in 2018. This book was re- released, Faith for Exiles, it's called, and they've done a heap of research with 19 to 29-year-olds, young people, uh, who were engaged in church. They're part of church life in North America and drew out some really um, interesting statistics. Uh, 54% of people in that age bracket uh, that were researched, thousands of young people, have either left the church for good or for an extended period of time. 36% of people, 36% of people in that age bracket have stayed in church, still attend the event of church, but their faith is disconnected from real life, the day-to-day life. Only 10% of people in that age bracket in North America and just leading into 2018 demonstrate what is called resilient faith, a faith that is connected and growing and engaged. Um, that's, a, that's a scary statistic. Um, that's what we've been talking about this year and we're going to press into that. There are five key things that exist in that 10% of young people, which would spread across all generations, uh, that are are, are kind of connected for that 10% of people. Was that clear? (laughs) Didn't sound clear as it came out. So I'm just going to read them here. These five things are present in all of those people who have resilient faith. A clear understanding of their identity in Christ, an ability to discern the culture they live in, they have meaningful intergenerational relationships, they're trained for vocational discipleship, which means that their faith lives and breathes and has activity in the workplace. Uh, And point five, they engage in counter-cultural mission, not necessarily cross-cultural, but counter-cultural mission. What we're going to talk about for the next three weeks is that second one, this ability to discern the culture in which you live. I'm going to pray and then uh, then we'll launch into it. Let's pray together. Father, we just come before you now. We're grateful for the opportunity to be uh, in your presence as a community, whether we're here in the room or we're at home uh, observing uh, through our TV. uh, We are here together to engage you, to worship you, to hear from you. And so, Lord, we just want to pause now as we uh, investigate this topic and open your word. We want your spirit to speak to us. So help us to put aside all other things that might distract us or uh, draw our attention away uh, and help us just to focus on what you want to say to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Cultural discernment. So what does that really mean? Let's define it a little bit. Here's a, uh, here's a definition. Taking part in a robust learning t- community under the authority of the Bible in order to wisely navigate an accelerated complex culture. This is for Christian people who are wanting to be a part of that picture that says my faith is resilient. It could take some hits. This is what it would look like to be culturally discerning. Now, it's a pretty wordy description, so I'll just leave it up on the screen there for a minute. Uh, I want us to just kind of, uh, kind of uh, pull that apart a little bit. A robust learning community might be uh, a life group or a home group environment, a group of people that you will connect with, that you're committed to, are committed to you, and you can have conversation that has a bit of pushback in a couple of directions about important topics. It might be a discipling relationship. It might be a one-on-one picture. It might be you with a couple of other people, but there's an ability to be robust in a learning community under the authority of the Bible. Uh, So what that means essentially is that we recognise that the Bible uh, is a baseline. It's God's word to you and I. Uh, It's truth outlined by the creator of the world and that becomes our filter, our benchmark and the the, the measuring stick of which we evaluate uh, different things. Uh, Wisely navigate, accelerated complex culture. Um, Yeah, culture in this world uh, is moving rapidly, it's changing quickly. Uh, Based on uh, technological advances, um, the Australian culture is different to the American culture, which is different to the African culture. And the culture, the environment that you live in is different in 2021 uh, compared to what it was in 1973 or 1873. And so there's a uh, a, a, a desire for us to understand what's happening in the culture around us at the moment and see what God is doing in that. In fact, the culture is different today than it was even just a couple of years ago. So that, that's what it looks like. So that description, uh, let me read it to you again. Taking part in a robust learning community under the authority of the Bible in order to wisely navigate an accelerated complex culture. The vast majority of people that are navigating the complexities of life today will not be using this description, this framework. Very few people in the Australian culture now actually identify themselves as Christian as distinct from 100 years ago. We were somewhere in the 90% range, mid 90% 100 years ago. Uh, We're now just over 50%. But when you come back to those statistics that I read out before, which are from the US and are pre-COVID, there are 10% of people who say that my faith is resilient and is actually interacting with my day-to-day life. Um, And you could probably make a case that those numbers are on the decrease at the moment. So it's a small number of people who are working with that kind of descriptor or that kind of framework. So how do people navigate the challenges of life if they're not using that? Well, it's a complex question which we want to unpack over the next couple of weeks. Um, Historically, a big decision or a challenge that uh, you might face as a young person, a a high school student, a uni student maybe, uh, when you faced a big decision, you would talk to someone. You would talk to your parents maybe. Um, You might talk to a a teacher at school or a university lecturer, uh, someone that you saw had wisdom and authority in your world. You would sit down and have a conversation with them. might be an aunt or an uncle. Or even going back some time, you might talk to uh, a person like a pastor, uh, a person who has authority in a a social setting around you. Um, That would be a common path to navigate some of life's challenges. But today, people generally, young people in the most part, generally don't do that. They turn to their technology primarily as their immediate response. They'll pick up their phone or their iPad or their Palm Pilot if their parents haven't updated them recently. (laughs) There's no one like that here. Um, They would uh, consult their device and they would look at what their social network would tell them about this important decision. 
And that might get a reference to a sporting celebrity or a movie star of some description, something like that. Or they just simply Google it. They have a question about an issue, about direction, about a diagnosis, about a, a challenge they face relationally or, or, or in terms of direction, maybe to do with finance, and they just go into the Google meter and work out what they should do. The device today is akin to a guide for the climber. It's your digital Sherpa, if you will. It's an interesting concept because... Uh, it just is all pervasive in our culture today. The question is, is it working? Does it actually help people make good decisions, discern wisdom on the topic that they are struggling with, the question that they have? Here's a couple more stats for you. Three out of five young adults today describe themselves as being stressed out. Seven out of ten young adults are worried about the future. These statistics have been sourced pre-COVID, believe it or not, uh, and released in 2018. The numbers are probably going up in that area. Now, before you start thinking that this message is just a uh, social science lecture, uh, you're going to need your Bible in a minute, so get ready for that. But we have to understand this stuff before we move forward. We have to understand the culture in which we live and how people are interacting with it. It's not just about the digital construct as well. The culture that we live in, uh, generally coming at us from television and all of those things around us, is offering our young people salvation and liberation from the challenges of life. The next generation is living, as those previous stats told us, with the, sorry, the ones that are up on the, uh, the, the screen there, are living with this constant under the current of a low level of stress and anxiety. That's how they live. It's just below the surface. And so when you see stats um, uh, in the media about drugs and about alcohol, about suicide and about road rage, about broken relationships and domestic violence... All of those things are on the increase because so many of our next generation are living right on the verge of just kind of uh, tipping over the edge. We live in, a, in an environment now where we have more access to leisure and luxury and pleasure and lifestyle than we've ever had, but the numbers are going up when it comes to stress and anxiety. So when we allow the internet to be our educator, our screens to be our guides, there will be some implications. Science and psychology tell us that the screen or the device, whichever it is, feeds something in your brain called the amygdala. That's the part of the brain that loves and soaks up instant gratification. So when you get a device... Uh, your, your, your brain is significantly stimulated and it continues to lust after more. So here's the question that Kinnaman asks on this topic. It's a question I heard this week from Tim Keller, asked in an interview with Kerry uh, Newhoff. The same kind of picture as they're talking about this current generation and how to reach them. The question is this. What, uh, so where would someone find real and livable wisdom in this complex culture? It's a really good question to ask. Where would someone find real and livable wisdom in the complex culture that we live? There are two sources that people currently pursue, as I said. The device is one, and the television networks that we seem to soak up so readily are offering us salvation and redemption as well. Give me two minutes on this. In the last 10 years, we've seen the rise of reality TV. Bryce Saville talked us through this uh, just recently. Uh, I want to use one television show that tells you about the pathway to salvation and redemption. Many of you have watched it. Um, most of these reality TV shows offer you three things. They offer you a priest... Uh, or a prophet who is to be served and obeyed. They'll offer you sacrifices that are required 
for you to achieve your goals and they'll offer you salvation that is something for you to strive for. Uh, the example I want to use is uh, Channel 9's TV show, The Block. Uh, Scott Cam is the priest or the uh, prophet who tells you what you need to do to receive salvation in this environment. He has three judges who work alongside him uh, and they will present to you what needs to be done and you will work very hard to appease uh, the judges and the guides, the prophets in this situation. As regular mere mortals like you and I, you are the contestants. You've been plucked out of obscurity. You may or may not have skills in terms of renovating a house, but you will be placed into this reality TV show should you be successful uh, and you have the opportunity to uh, meet the needs that the gods put forward. Each week you'll be on a knife's edge, standing in a line, waiting to hear if the striving and the efforts that you have put in have been enough to appease those who will make this judgment. Then there are the sacrifices you will have to make along the way. It's 12 weeks in the program. You'll have to give up contact with your family. You'll have long hours uh, renovating and shopping. Um, you'll have different, very difficult decisions to make about kitchens and bathrooms and storage. Important stuff. You'll leave your families behind and you'll live in for this months-long test of your willingness to do what's required. The stress of it will see a breakdown for you, uh, potentially as an individual, or risk your marriage. It'll damage relationships with people around you as you strive for the ultimate goal. And ultimately, the goal that's been put forward, the salvation picture, is for you to sell this house for a, you know, a half million dollar plus windfall, to get rid of your mortgage, to have peace and contentment that only money can buy, to become a celebrity, have an endorsement with a tile company, maybe move from obscurity of the life that you are pushing back on right now into a life of celebrity and being worshipped by people around you to get what those around you can't get. This is the subtle replacement that the culture that we live in puts in place as it pushes aside Christian values. As it pushes aside the concept and the reality of a creator and God who's overseeing and sees all, as we move that aside, this is the kind of thing we replace it with. With people that we uh, reach up to strive for with tasks that they set for us that are out of reach normally but we can achieve if we work hard enough and there's a windfall that we don't understand but we think will make us happy. All of these shows operate the same whether it's MasterChef, Lego Masters, X Factor, Australian Armour, uh, uh, Australian Armour, that's a new one coming out, um, <laughs> you'll love that, uh, setting Glen Rowan in Victoria. <laughs> a farmer wants an, a, a wife, Australian Idol, Beauty and the Geek, Survivor. They're all built on this same structure of saying, we're going to remove God from our value system, but we'll retain some of the key principles and we'll activate them within our own control for our own outcomes. So the question is, what does Christianity have to offer in this cultural setting? How would Jesus speak into this kind of picture? Does the Bible have anything to say about reality TV? Have you looked it up in your concordance and, and looked under ours? Take your Bible, if you have one there, and we're just going to flip over a couple of really key stories in Scripture. Uh, you'll see in Genesis chapter 37 to uh, chapter th uh, 50, the story of Joseph. Joseph, uh, this is a, a picture of a faithful man of God who finds himself in a, sit, a setting where resistance is normal. He's rejected by his brothers and he's seen as an oddball. They take him away and they have this intent to kill him. Their reason for doing that is because they want to pursue their own fulfilment. 
Joseph lives in this, in this sort of uh, uh, culture that is trying to take him down. But he has to rise above that, above the oppression of those around him. And to do that, he has to live by, stay true to the values that God has placed in his heart and in his life that are from Scripture, that are foundational. Consider the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, the first 10 verses, tell us the story of the call of Jeremiah, where he's called as a prophet to preach to the nation of Israel and literally they, they, they will resist and push back and won't repent for his whole ministry career. Uh, verse 5 tells us this. Uh, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you, uh, before you were born, I set you apart. I point, appointed you as prophet to the nations. Jeremiah has to understand and stick by the, the call and the principal value that God has placed on his life. Even though his whole ministry, he will be rejected from the message that he puts forward. He'll be physically abused and tortured as a result, but he has to stand on the principle and the value that God has put forward for him. Take Daniel as an example, and we'll dig into this in the next couple of weeks. Daniel uh, chapters 1 to 3. Daniel faces the pressures of the Babylonian system as the, 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 the people of God are exiled and taken over by the Babylonians, the culture of the day. He has to change his name and give up his God-given heritage as he lives under this biblical, uh, sorry, this captivity by the uh, Babylonians. But he refuses to bow to the pressure uh, and hold on to his belief and his trust in God. He won't be shaken from that. His peers, his brothers uh, in God uh, stay the same course, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And you see... Um, a really telling picture in, I think it's chapter 3, where uh, they are under severe pressure and they're about to be thrown into the furnace as the heat's turned up and they say to uh, those that are oppressing them, the Babylonian leadership, we totally trust that God will save us from this. But even if he doesn't, this faith that says uh, we're not going to buckle under the pressure, that the culture that we live in now is drawing us, seeking to draw us away from God, but we won't move. King David, before he was king, in 1, chapter, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 22, uh, verses all the way through to chapter 24, he's being pursued. He and his uh, inner sanctum, his core team, are being pursued by Saul because he's been identified and anointed as the next king, but he's not in place yet. So Saul is trying to hunt him down and have him killed. And uh, he's in a cave hiding out. Saul comes in to relieve himself and his team say to him, uh, you've got to go and finish this now. Saul has been delivered to you. Go and kill him, right? Sort this out. And they even leverage God in that and say, maybe it's God who delivered him into the cave. Quick, quick, go and finish him off. And he goes up there and his conviction about who he is as a person won't allow him to do it. And in uh, uh, chapter 24, verse 6, he says, I won't lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. If God wants to take him out, he can do it. I don't need to do his work for him. You move into the New Testament and you see, uh, as uh, Don Banks shared with us last week, uh, in communion, uh, the Apostle Paul's speech in Acts chapter 17, uh, verse 17, is in the Areopagus and he's talking to the Greek leaders of the community and he's saying, I recognise that you are religious people or you are spiritual people. Let me tell you about the one that you worship that you don't know. Uh, they have a, a, a kind of an idol there, a picture, uh, an icon of an unknown God and Paul says, let me explain this to you. We see this in Peter's life, we see it in uh, John's life. Great pictures in Scripture. The Gospel is the heart of Scripture. It's the story of Jesus and it will push back against the culture from time to time. Our culture will lead us to a place that takes us away from God 
And we see that in our current setting in so many different ways. So for you to stay the course, to have resilient faith, you have to be able to discern the culture. You need wisdom, knowledge and courage. In 1 Chronicles 12, this is the description of the men of Ishakar. They were a tribe of men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. What a fantastic picture of faithful people of God, the men of Ishakar. That's what we need in today's setting. Uh, people who understand the times and know what Israel, God's people, what God would want us to do. You contrast that against uh, the picture in Judges 17 verse 6. In the days when Israel had no king, has no leadership, has no direction that's tapping into the heart of God. And every di everyone did as they saw fit in their own eyes. That's the contrast into today's setting. With the removal of God, the distancing of values uh, that, that God has laid down for us, everyone around you does as they see fit in their own eyes. So what do we do about that? How do we respond to that in our culture today? Well, I want to give you three tips here. The first one is this. If you're the kind of person who wants to find the fingerprints of God in the culture, here are some tips. The first one is be prepared. Know that the, that the challenge exists around you. The culture is actively trying to draw you away from God, from Jesus and the values that are laid down in Scripture. The challenge for you and I is to stay engaged in culture but not be hiding from the challenges that are present. So we need to know that those challenges exist. Don't run away from it. Face the culture and engage. I say this because lots of people in church land get caught into a church bubble. They just mix with people who are inside the church and they speak of those outside the church like that, like they're outside the church, I'm in, you're out, and there becomes this kind of um, protective wall uh, that is the wall of the building or the wall of the community. But God doesn't want us to be disconnected from the culture. He actually wants us to engage because there's a message for those people. We don't want to bury our heads in the sand. The next generation that you minister to, whether it be your kids or grandkids, can't afford you to bury your head in the sand because they have to live in this culture. They need wisdom and engagement. And the second reason on that point is because the culture actually wants to connect with God. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says this, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He's also, God that is, has set eternity eternal things in the human heart. Some translations will say in the heart of every man or in the heart of every person. A part of how you are made up is how God has created you is that God has set something inside every one of you that longs for eternity. So when the world or the culture around you offers you uh, salvation and redemption through uh, a renovation of a house or the purchase of a good or the singing of a song or the making of a cake or whatever it is, that will not be enough. You might do very well at that. You might renovate like no one has ever renovated before and you'll be an outstanding renovator. You will have a, a, a title of Dr. Renovator. Right? And you will be able to do lectures on renovation and host your own TV show, but it won't answer that question about what God has set in your heart about what you really long for. What the culture puts forward is always going to come up short. And so when Solomon says that God has set something in the heart of every human heart, 
It's a reason for us to not hide from the culture. Actually, people want something. They are seeking something. Adam Packer, one of our interns here on Wednesday this week, along with Don Sisson, uh, Don had received a phone call from uh, a Filipino student who lives in a share house accommodation uh, environment. Are you okay for me to tell the story, Don? No? Okay. Hey. <laughs> I didn't ask Don, but I did just then, so it's fine. <laughs> I'll be fine for tonight. Uh, and so uh, he gets a, a call from this uh, uh, student. Uh, there's five of them live in this share house and they're having some real anxiety around their living environment. They feel like something's going on that they can't see. It's like a spiritual thing. And so they ask Don to come and pray for them. So Don, it was on Wednesday, he grabs Adam, who's one of our interns, and they go around there and they pray. They hear some stories of these people, right, about what they're struggling with and what the challenges are in their environment at that time. And then Don says, in line with what Ecclesiastes tells us about the heart, Don says, hey, listen, where do you sit with God? What's your, what's your connection with God? And they oh, you know, um, have you got five minutes? Sure. So he explains the gospel, the bigger picture to them uh, in five minutes and uh, moments later all five of those people are now uh, sons and daughters of God. They're in the kingdom of God. There is, there is something in the heart of people that God placed there that says, even if you solve this issue for me, you build this thing out of Lego, there's more to life than that, believe it or not. Here's the second tip. Be in the word. We're going to talk more about this next week. When you think about yourself as a person who lives in this culture that is actively being drawn away from values and Bible and principles of the kingdom, you live in that culture and you say, how do I interact with other people? And you say to yourself, what do I have that's different to the rest of the community around me? You have two things. You have the Spirit of God dwelling within you and you have the Word of God. This is God's letter to you. He's written down, he stepped in and lived amongst us and has collated the old story and the redemptive story in this one book. It's God's words, his love letter to you. It's his motivation, it's his attitude, it's his posture, it's his heart, it's his compassion. It all comes out in this story. And so if you want to live out something that's different in the culture, you've got to be in the word. You've got to be reading it regularly. Otherwise, you'll only have what those around you have to offer. We're going to talk more about that as we unpack that uh, next week in particular. Um, but God's word is living and powerful. It's alive to change lives. And then the third point, very important for the next generation, is that this issue of interacting and discerning culture is a discipleship issue. It's a discipleship issue. We need to be engaged across generations in each other's lives. We need to be talking about real stuff. This is where we landed our James series last week in James 5.16 about confessing your sins to one another, your brothers and sisters, because it's powerful as we address God and say, I want this to change in my life. It's not a redemption issue per se, it's not a salvation issue, but it's a liberation issue. I want to grow in my faith. And so we have the power to do that as we disciple and invest into each other's lives. I'm going to pray in a moment to kind of land this opening message, but I want you to understand a couple of really key verses. You know, I look at what's happening in our environment right now, just in this last sort of month or so, where we've had uh, lockdowns and masks and the restrictions placed upon us, and the challenges that that presents to us as Christians. And I think it's, it's, it's really significant that all that is happening right now, whether it be uh, around COVID and testing and deaths 
and lockdowns and border closures and masks and all the limitations that are placed upon us is that it's restricting the things that the culture values, which is why there's such strong pushback. So when you take God out of the picture and you say, you're just going to live life, you're going to do as you see fit in your own eyes, as Judges 17 tells us, you decide that family and relationships and freedom are the primary things that we live for. That's what we really go after in our culture. So we want to have a, 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 a really free and liberated and comfortable life we want to have family that are well educated and do well and we want to be able to spend time with people we love. And so the current environment has actually pressed on all of those things pretty hard. So if your mother, for example, has just passed away in New South Wales, it's hard to get there. And it's only hard to get there because the government's telling you you can't go because of restrictions and border closures, etc. Uh, and we want to live happy lives making money and, and gaining more possessions, but locking down industries is making it difficult to do that and we're getting annoyed about it. And because we're a relatively wealthy nation, we like to travel and see different things and, and the government have told us we can't travel overseas. They're limiting our freedom of movement. These are things that the culture holds very high and we're all getting pretty annoyed about it. But what is the Christian's response in that? How do we respond as individuals? Two verses that I want you to look at and I want you to really consider this week because these are the key distinctives between us and the culture that lives around us, right? The first one is, uh, comes from John's Gospel. Uh, chapter 13, verse 35. By this, Jesus speaking uh, to his disciples, there's a crowd around, by this everyone will know you are my disciples, you're my followers, learners of me, you've committed your life to following uh, and growing into who I'm making you to be, that's what that means. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Those who don't have scripture and biblical value and the Holy Spirit to guide them don't have that value. So that's a distinctive for you and I. They can try and be nice to other people. They can try and um, be gracious. But people will know that you're connected with God by the way you love one another because you're tapped into God's love. Galatians 5. This is the fruit of that. This is the evidence of that. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So this is rubber hitting the road type stuff. You're not allowed to travel into state. You're not allowed to sit in that seat in the footy. You're not allowed to not have your mask on when you're going here, there or wherever. But these things here... There is no law against them. You can still love, have joy, have peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. So as you interact with the culture right now, today, as you walk out this door, as you talk to people at morning tea over a pink bun and a cup of tea, and you think about your general responses to COVID and borders and masks and lockdowns, it gives us insight into what's happening deep down in you. You have the opportunity to present something different to the culture around you. You and I have the Spirit of God living in us, the assurance of his salvation, the confidence of his leading, the trust in his sovereignty, things that the broader culture doesn't possess. So as we interact, as we observe the challenges around us, as we respond to them, we should be able to rise above what those around us can't rise above because of who we're connected to. We can see love as our higher goal. We can live in a supernaturally promised peace. As evidenced by Don and Adam this week, just this week, Wednesday, as I said, they walked into a home where that supernatural 
covering and care and reality, understanding, didn't exist. And two people came into that home who have that, the Spirit of God dwelling in them. And they walked out as seven people who have that. You might hold a view as a Christian, as an informed citizen, as a highly intelligent person about what is happening around us at the moment. And you might well be right. It's quite possible that your understanding about COVID and about government and about masks and about restrictions might be accurate. But there is a higher call on your life to deliver about how you love one another and how you live out that conviction with the fruit of the Spirit evident. Here's a couple of questions. Oh, sorry. Here's a couple of... I'm biting into uh, pink bun time right now. Uh, I might have to exit out the back. Here's a couple of questions. Six, in fact. The first four come as a package as you observe the culture around you. These will be helpful for you to make assessment. What's right, what's wrong, what's missing, what's confused. If the world or the culture or the TV show or the the social media post or whatever it is is presenting something to you, have a set of filters that will help you understand what's right, what's wrong, what's missing and what's confused. Okay, And then five and six go together. As you think about your response to the situations you find yourself in. Where do I see the fingerprints or, as Bryce would say, the signs of life around me? Where is God doing something? What is he up to? Where do I see that? And then secondly, as I respond to that, what's the fruit of my choice? Is it love, joy, peace, patience? Is it fear, anxiety, stress, anger, pushback, falling into line with cultural responses. There's a lot to process. I want to pray and then I'm going to ask uh, Dacia and the team to come and lead us in our final song. Father, we just come before you now. The culture we live in is challenging. It's moving fast. It's drawing us away from you. It has temptations and offers that you are not in. And Lord, as people who are connected to you, who live with the Spirit of God in us, who have tasted life beyond what this world can offer, who have an eternal destiny that is uh, in your presence, we don't want to hide from the challenges we face in our community around us, but we want to respond appropriately. So give us wisdom as we discern the culture around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.